Welcome to Southern Soul Chat, where this season we will be diving into the stories of individuals who have navigated the deeper waters of faith. I'm your host, Dr. Miranda Ferguson, and together we'll explore the journeys of people who've taken that courageous step forward in their faith. Get ready to be inspired as we uncover the incredible stories of unwavering belief and the remarkable impact it's had. If you're excited to join us on this faith-filled exploration, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Let's step forward. Hey guys, welcome to our podcast episode number 14. This week is uh, Faith in the Storm, where we are going to get into a vital aspect of the Christian journey, navigating trials and fears. Contrary to popular misconceptions, being a Christian doesn't always exempt us from life's challenges. Instead, it equips us with tools to face all of those challenges with faith and resilience. So today, I want you to join along with me and my guest, Amoatoye Mackenday, as we talk with her about her story and how she's walked with God through storms, acknowledging the presence of fear and trials, while discovering the transformation and the power of faith in those situations. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. I feel so um, honored to be here and excited to, it'll be fun just to <laughs> chat with you today. She also goes by Toye, which I will probably, if I say her name, use it just because I told her I don't want to butcher her beautiful name. Um, she says it much better than I do. My <laughs> southern, my southernness does not give your name the beauty <laughs> that it deserves. Um, so um, again, thank you for being here. I'm so excited um, to just let people hear mm. your story. Um, as I was telling her before we got started, a lot of times I believe that as Christians, we think that um, we have some kind of shelter or a guard around Mm -hmm. adversity Mm -hmm. and trials and that maybe um, when things happen, we get upset that we didn't have the faith we should have had, that how how dare me be a follower of Christ and still be scared. Mm -hmm. And I was um, telling her that as I was preparing for this and thinking about her story, it just reminds me so much about the story with the disciples and Jesus in the boat. Uh, it's referenced in Matthew and some other sections um, as well. And we can get into that in a little bit. But um, the thought is, is, is remembering, and in my mind, remembering that um, they were in a boat with a living and breathing Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was physically present. That's right. And they were still scared half to death. <sighs> well, and the storm still happened. And the storm yeah. was still happening, and he was standing right there. Yeah, yeah. And so today I know you'll be discussing some struggles and some issues um, that you've faced in your life, mm-hmm. where I'm sure there were times where you were like, where are you? Yes. Mm-hmm. How can this be happening? Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to share all your good stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that today I, that you know the listeners know that today we are just going to talk about real life and um how we all we all struggle with this. Mm-hmm. We all do. I've yet to meet a person who who just walks through and and is always like, "Oh, that's that's this is a great storm. I mm-hmm. love the lightning and the thunder." I think we get better. Yeah. I think we get better if if we always reflect over the stones of what God's given us of remembrance. Right. Um, but I don't think it ever a hundred percent takes it away. Maybe right. it does. I actually love that analogy, the the kind of the picture you painted there of the, the stones, because um, that was actually something that I journaled about during the course of all the season that we'll talk about here in a little bit of just the importance of marking those moments when we encounter God with stones along the way and those actually become an altar where like and you can go back to the old testament from genesis the way god would deal with abraham the way he 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 dealt with jacob and each time there was an encounter where god showed them something of who he was usually either through or after a moment of adversity they say they would build an altar um, after the children of Israel passed the, um, the, the Jordan into the promised land, they again gathered stones as a memorial. So it's like, I, I just remember it just painted, it reminded me of how important it is to mark those moments when God shows you who he is, when he teaches, teaches us something 
those become a memorial, those become a place of, of altar for us um, that, can hope, that we can come back to, you know, when we need reminding. And something we will. <laughs> you, oh yeah, you will. <laughs> in Joshua, when they when he parts the water for the second time, mm-hmm. in case you guys didn't know that it happens more than once, there's a little small verse that I think people may miss. I missed it for a long time. Um, maybe it was just me, but it says, and they're still there today. Mm-hmm. Now, in a literal sense, I don't know if they're literally still there, right? Because mm-hmm. the Bible was written a long, long time ago. But what that says to me, in a non-literal sense, is that the stones are there because they're in their heart. Mm -mm -mm. The memories Mm -mm. are still there today. Mm -mm. The thoughts Mm -mm. are still there today. What God did is still there today. And it's a small little verse that would be easily just overlooked if you're reading the story. But when God gives you, at least it's been my experience, when God gives you stones of remembrance, a story to share, a testimony Mm -hmm. to continue telling, it's still there today. Yes, And I love that. Yeah, I love that. Even if I'm on the mountaintop and everything's great, I'm not in the valley for the moment. Those things, those ways God moved the way he had provision, they're still there today. Yeah. Because like you said, I'm not staying there forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm coming down. It is yeah. it is a promise I'm coming down. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so there's a little mini, we got to look at that. We could be done. We gave a mini Bible lesson. <laughs> <laughs> we can go home. <laughs> Just kidding. No way. Cause she's going to share her great story. So how about you um, tell everybody who you are, mm-hmm. you know, what, what do you do? And then we're going to get into your story. Yeah. Well, um, my name is Amatoya McIndy. Um, Usually people aren't here call me Toye for short. It's because we butcher your name. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I've been here in the Houston Northwest area for, it'll be 10 years this year, actually. Oh, wow. Yeah, I know. That's gone really fast. Um, what brought me here, a combination of just like, just interesting God incidences, but um, came here for work. 10 years ago, um, I work in human resources, so uh, do that for a living. I'm married, been married for this year, it'll be 14 years. Woo! <laughs> yeah. 14 years of marriage. That's right, yeah. <laughs> that's the girl these days, that's a big number. Well, no, yeah, thank God. Um, and then I have two children, um, Angela, who is five, he just turned five, and Eliana, who just turned two. So yeah, that's a little bit about me and my family. How are you enjoying the age of five? We just we just had one turn five last month. How how's that working at your house? It is fun because uh, he's now finally at an age where like he can communicate actually pretty well. Like before, it used to be like I know he has a lot to say, but I don't understand it all. <laughs> yeah. But now it's like I understand it. He's he's you know, their vocabulary just, just expands exponentially. So we get these fun conversations, you know, where like they're starting, their little minds are starting to put things together. So, um, we get sometimes just the most entertaining (laughs) questions. Whereas with Eliana, she's at the stage, she just turned two and I can tell little Miss Sassy Pants that she's got, she's got a lot to say too. And she's coming, it's coming. But like right now I just don't understand, you know, hardly any of it. That's so cute. We're, we're, uh, we just had one turn four. So we are out of the, don't know what you're talking about Mm -hmm. stage completely. But let me tell you with all those kids in our house, everybody has a lot to say. I'm sure. So get ready. It's coming. (laughs) Okay. So, um, so tell us, let's just start with like your upbringing, your childhood, mm-hmm. where you're from, mm-hmm. and um, we'll just go from there. Yeah, so Take off. Um, I'm, my family's Nigerian, so I was born here in the United States, but lived in Nigeria probably till I was, I don't know, about 11, and then my family moved um, back here to the States while we were here. I went off to the UK for boarding school and actually lived most of my life there, so did school and uni, met my husband, started my career, all of that in the United Kingdom. Um, And this is why I have a weird accent too. It's got all the things in there. (laughs) Um, But yeah, got married, moved with my husband to the Middle East, and and then we moved here. Um, Family background, I am so grateful and blessed that um, grew up in a Christian home, grew up in a musical home, which is another part of just just my story and who I am today. um, very just, I don't know 
you know, people have this story of like, you know, I met Jesus on this day. Right. And I don't have that. What I have is just like being immersed in it from for as long as I can remember and it just being a part of what I know. Um, but then, of course, what happens is you mature in that. And at some point it goes from being the thing that we do in our house to this is my relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. This is this is who he is to me, not just because of the songs and the m- memory verses I learned as a kid, not just because um, what my dad said or what my mom said, but because I've experienced it. I know it now. You get that kind of like individual personal witness and conviction of who God is. So, um, and and <clears throat> and even with that, that wasn't that's not been a one time thing in my life. I feel like um, it probably happened. You know, when I was about seven, again, when I was 12, again, when um, when I was, I think I was about 19 when I got baptized by immersion. So, like, there's, it's just been this, like, growing maturity and growing awareness of Jesus, a growing relationship and maturity of that relationship with Jesus. But, yeah, so faith and music, those are the two things that basically the foundation of my life and was built on. this woman can sing. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> this woman can sing a tune in many buckets. Hey. <laughs> was your was your mother, your father both musical or just? Yeah, so um, my, my dad's really the, the main kind of like musician person he was uh, a director of music um and for for the longest time he led a like a like a worship team ensemble so we used to do concerts and things like that and pretty much almost everybody in my family was a part of that at some point (laughs) my mom was for sure my aunts were um, I think my brother play, played the drum for that group at some point. Everybody I, had a rotation. Everybody had out. a rotation yep. in, in and out. And um, somewhere in some archives, there is a picture of us performing at the National Theater in Lagos. And um, I, w- I would have been about f- somewhere between the six, between five and seven. And uh, and I had like a little <laughs> step stool. They put me on a chair so that I could like actually reach the <laughs> microphone. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> So you've been doing it for a while. Yes, I've been doing it for a while. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing though. What a what a fun thing to look back into your childhood mm. and see all the stages. Yes. That you were able to participate in. Yeah. Like you said a lot of people look back in their childhood and and even their early adult years and they're just like, yeah, there's nothing. Mm, mm. There's not there's nothing. Yeah. It happened in this moment. Yeah. And then it's getting better from there exactly so yeah. what a blessing it is an enormous like I it's you know speaking of stones like it is one thing that I am so grateful for because you know it didn't have to be like that and I know it's not like that for a lot of people and it's not good or bad one way or the other I'm just grateful that that is my story and that God saw fit to um to bring me to him in that way you know and y'all, she uses it so. <laughs> God gave it to the right person. She just overflows. You do. You overflow with just helping people and and loving on people well, and and you share and your heart and you, mm-hmm. you talk to people. And I mean, you can tell that you that comes from a place of just being so close. Mm. Well, thank you. You know, we're, I know sometimes we're not always right no. smack with him, we're, but we're absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, it, there are some times where there is some distance, yes. but you can tell that you just have a maturity that has grown, like you're talking about, mm-hmm. just by the way you you interact and when you're talking about seasons in your life, mm-hmm. um, you just see mm-hmm. such spiritual maturity. Mm-hmm. So yeah. go home and thank your parents today. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it might not be Mother's Day yet, but call them anyway. Sure, <laughs> call them anyway. Okay, so we'll skip up to um, let's like skip to your later years, like mm-hmm. at, you know college, mm-hmm. and and then how you went into the world past that, and what was going on, yeah, and, and your hubby, and all all the good stuff that's gonna set the stage. Yeah, so. Um, you know, met my husband in what 2007. Met him at a wedding. I was singing at a wedding. That's how we met. Look at that gift already paying <laughs> off. <laughs> your mate, your gift will make room for you. There you That's go. What the Bible says. Anyway, um, so we met at the wedding. It took us a it took us a whole year, by the way, just like to start dating or whatever. And speaking of seasons in life, like 
just even starting there, here I was a single, what was I, 25 year old at the time. And oh, by the way, like um, (laughs) in the script that I had written for my own life, I would have already been married by that point. Um, Wait, before 25? Yeah, well, my mom got married at 21. And so like, you know, I just, I just, well, and if not married, at least have found the one or- With someone. You know, whatever, like, and- and 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 it wasn't coming for me like um just hadn't you know i had my my list that i prayed to god about and here i was faithful in serving him which was you know (laughs) there was a lot of i all my time was spent either at work or at church yeah so um (laughs) you're like i'm putting all the hours in i I am i sure am um so anyways i uh, met him in 2007 it took us a whole year to like okay we're dating we're like calling this thing official whatever and um another what is it 18 months or so before we got engaged but anyway we we got married in 2010 and um uh and again you know like the the script that we had for our life was you know get married you know spend the first year or two just trying to focus on us and and build our relationship and friendship and do all of the things that, you know, get harder to do once you bring kids mm. into the picture. But, you know, we figured, you know, year two, year three, um, you know, for kids and whatnot. And um and it was it was just a very long season season of 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 waiting. Waiting, 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 waiting. Um and the we, we moved to the Middle East, and that was a, a lesson in itself of just, you know, everywhere we've moved to and every place we've gone, we've always gone with the conviction of, like, God is with us. You know, we don't want to go somewhere unless, Lord, we know that you're with us. And so even the move to the Middle East was bathed in prayer and, like, asking for God to confirm if that was the right move and, and whatnot. Um, so we knew that it was. But for me personally, it was hard because leaving behind 17 years of relationship, of career, of um, of legacy, of reputation. You know, I was I'd recorded an album. I was singing on other albums. I would, you know, like life was good, and and all the things that you 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 want were just falling right into place, and. Um, even career wise, you know, I joke, I joked with you when we talk of like, um, the first thing anybody ever asks you when you introduce yourself, you know, is I am so and so and this is what I do, right? right. You know, it's where our identity is so wrapped up into that. And um, I moved to Dubai, leaving all of that behind. And I remember just the realization that in introducing myself, I could no longer say, I do blah, de blah. I'm, right. <laughs> I'm now just like Leia's wife. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's all I got. That's all I got. That's that's all I am. And um, it was really a revelation of just how much of my identity had been wrapped in that I do this and I'm called that and my title is this and my position is that. Well, how blah, hard blah. you had worked. Well, yeah, you had worked so hard yeah, for all that. Of course. And I love how you say, um, you say like my script. Mm. My script. Yeah. So mm. you had wrote your script, mm-hmm. and it was looking really good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, and it was for the most part, it was working out like God. I mean, listen, God, I I make no mistake. God has been kind to me, like beyond what I deserve. And even though, yes, there have been these disappointments and things and in places where we've I wouldn't have it any other way, honestly, to go back. But um, but yeah, so that that's where I was. And and, you know, I felt like the in, in Hosea. Um, it talks about how God calls you into the desert to speak tender things to you. And that's kind of what I, what I felt like, like I am literally living in a desert I was about desert to say, right isn't now. the Middle East like yes. a desert? Yes. <laughs> I am literally living in the desert and God is just sweetly and tenderly like reshaping what identity looks like for me and what it looks like to live in the truth that I am who I am in him, not in my job, in my role, in my position, in my title, whatever. 
Um, and I remember just weeping. I think it was my 32nd birthday or something like that. Just God, God just gifted me with that. And, and um, I'm, I'm, I can't promise that I remember that lesson very well all the time. I still kind of get things a little confused. And Well, that's because we live in a culture mm-hmm. here in the United States. I don't know if that's everywhere, mm-hmm. but it's really, imp- you said it's really important here who you are and that your, co- your credentials walk in the door before you do. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That they come in. And then you come and buy them. Right. Like we've put so much emphasis. Um, I think about, even if you go past credentials, I think about how many people um, view people who, in, who are in Hollywood yeah. as that they're movie stars. Right. It doesn't really matter anything else about them. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that leads mm-hmm, for them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we as a society seem to get really tied up on not knowing who a person really is. Mm not knowing what their life really looks like, Mm -hmm. but what is their title? Mm -hmm. You know, how important are they? How many follows do they have? Mm -hmm. Are they on TikTok Mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, What are they selling on TikTok? Cause I got to have it. And, and I think in this day and age, we are just really wrapped up with that. Mm -hmm. Really, really immersed in that. And we see people as their title and not who they are. And there's some good in that. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of bad in it too. So what a blessing to um, have God work on you with your identity. I had a similar story before we came to Texas where God, we, we got to Texas and then I got sent back to Alabama, mm. um, which we shared in our podcast early on that a judge actually sent my child back. Well, <laughs> if my child's going, so am I. Mm. And so um, I, I believe now looking back, it's easier to look back and see it. In the midst, it didn't look so <laughs> so clear cut. But I was sent back and I thought about the story of the ravens mm. and uh, the brook of Sheriff. Yeah. yeah. Did I say it right? There Sheriff, you go. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the story there of how God was working on showing that you just need what he supplies. Right. You don't have to be self-efficient in titles or right. ability. Right. And um, I know now that God met me and sending me back. I couldn't understand why I'm Again, I, I had just graduated with my doctorate, so it none of it mattered. Mm. Like my title didn't matter, my education didn't matter, nothing I'd ever done good ever like good for the kingdom seemed to matter. Like God was working on my heart. Mm. And he took me to the Brook of Cherith mm. and sat with me there for what seemed like eternity. I'm sure yours probably felt mm. like eternity too. Um, but he was giving me a lesson of who I was in him mm. and really scraping away some old stuff and, and going, this is, this is not, this is not who you are. This is not important. And so I've had that lesson. Mm -hmm. And so I can relate. Mm -hmm. I can relate. I didn't like it when I was in it. (laughs) It was Mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. Um, but God is good at what he says he does, which is making old things new. Yes. Amen. And recreation. Mm -hmm. So, um, so for any of you out there who are feeling like God has you in a season, of being in the desert, Mm -hmm. my suggestion would be to uh, enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. And to, and to receive God's love in there. Like sometimes like exactly what it says in in Jose, I called you to the desert so that I could speak tenderly to you because sometimes when you're in the hustle and bustle of the city, Mm -hmm. you know, you can't hear them. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, and speaking of identity as a woman, right? Like part of your identity is wrapped up in being a wife and in being a mother and all of that. And so um, left the Middle East. Um, Were you guys trying there in the Middle East? Oh, yeah. yeah so yeah, like yeah. you got married, had a few years uh-huh. of just trying to adjust to Well, we even marriage. started trying early, even before like we, we thought we were absolutely ready for it. Just... Um, I think we hit month 13 of our... <laughs> a year's good. A year's good. Forget the two years. A year will do it. <laughs> of, our, of our marriage. And we were like, okay, let's start working on, on this thing. Um, Did you feel like your age was a big factor? Like where you felt like you were racing against a clock? At the time, no. But I have a thing called PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which I know a lot of people have. And so we knew that um, it probably might take a, a little longer. So... Um, uh, I started, you know, on the, started um, with acupuncture and with um, Clomid and, you know, some of these other things, taking metformin, like, to try to 
get my cycle regular and, and all of those things and trying to get hormones in the right place. So did that for, for a few years. Um, we did a few cycles while we were out there. We did a few cycles of, I forget exactly what it's called now, but it's where you take the Clomid. They're like monitoring how your ovaries are, um, are, um, are growing. You release the egg and you know, you got to time everything just so. And, um, we did, we did a few cycles of that and like nothing like zip, not even, not even a pregnancy or anything, just, just nothing. But it was, I, I remember what was so kind of fatiguing was, I mean, it was in and out of the clinic, like almost on a weekly basis. It's just tiring after a while. Um, lots of like, and I don't, in outside of this, like I don't, I'm not the kind of person who, I don't take a, t- a ton of medication or, or anything like that, thank God. But like to have to be just, you know, pumping your body all the time. And and then there was other, you know, I changed my diet because, you know, you got to cut this out and cut that out. And so just doing all the things. And so we'd already started that that journey of, of trying. Um, around 20, what, 15, 16. So I was already here at that point. And coming here to Houston was, like I shared early on, just a God incidence. Like, we didn't we didn't just, like, oh, pick a place on the map and let's just go. <laughs> throw throw, a, throw <laughs> a dart in his no, state. No, 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 no. <laughs> we, were, we were very thoughtful and prayerful and submitting the whole journey to God. And, and God made provision for sure. And he had even given us a word in Jeremiah 32 about how he was – the verse talks about how he's going to plant you there and um, and he will delight in doing good for you there. And I remember when God, when I received that word, just feeling so like, wow, thank you, God, just for confirming. Um, and part of part of the story about moving here was I moved here and I was expecting my husband to be right behind me. Um because typically you move together. That's right. <laughs> um, but for you know, and and Ideally, you know, we wanted for him to be moving with a job and into a job. And um, the job that he had in Abu Dhabi was supposed to be like the vehicle to do that. It wasn't working out. He was trying to get a job here. That wasn't working out. Um, I think it was in 2015 or 16 or so where he like he quit his job, came out here for a few months. Nothing was working out like he couldn't find anything. So then he went he went back um, and 2016, I think, was almost like this climax of, I remember sitting in my journal and listing out all the things. God, I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for this. You told me this, but here I am. And, I, you know, I, it was, I was dissatisfied in my job. I was obviously, you know, we were still trying at this point. Like, we had decided that we were going to try IVF. So um, 2016 would mean I was probably on... Um, try number two with with IVF, um, um, and then not just for me and my husband, but just even in my family, there was just a lot of things, you know, that we were we were waiting on. And I remember sitting um, in our in our um, game room, praying to God and like li- literally like listing all the things. And, and I just heard in my heart, my grace is sufficient for you. And I got so frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, but I love your honesty because you know a lot of people would have been like, and that Mm-mm. just moved me. It's, no, I held on to that, but I love your like, no, no, Lord. no, no. I was <laughs> frustrated, and I remember like my eyes went right open, and I like screamed at my ceiling. And I'm gonna say this in your vowel translate. Say grace, la fête Jenny, which is transliterated. I can't eat grace. Mm, that's good. I can't eat grace. Don't talk to me about grace. <laughs> Talk to me about these things. You're like, I got you my know, list. I got the list. And, <laughs> these you- are, and oh, by the way, you promised. So where are all the things? And um, but, you know, 
you kind of throw your tantrum and, and the Lord is so sweet and kind to us that we can do that. Um, and, and, you know, I calmed down and I started to reflect and started to realize how the evidence of his grace through all the various seasons that we had been working, we had been walking in, and and how um, thinking of stones, how it was that like, yes, God hasn't answered this thing, but oh my gosh, look how faithful He's been through these all these other things, things yeah. right? But we you know? sometimes we don't pay attention to those because they're not on the list. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, and 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 you know, like some things in in a moment matter more more than others. And speaking of identity, I will tell you, like being here, there's in this culture in particular, like in the the church culture here in the U U S. Um, I think the whole thing about being a wife and a mother is especially a thing here. Really? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, because I remember, like, even as in building community and building relationship and building friendship, like. I always felt judged for the fact that I was here and we don't see your husband and you've been married all this time and wait, what, you don't yeah, have and kids he's, and he's not know, here. You don't yeah, have kids. Like what's your like deal? You're, like you're an alien. <laughs> yeah, no, for real. Like I think people, you know, mostly kind of whatever, but you could kind of, you, you know, and then on top of that, like I'm working and, you know, so it, it was almost like the silent, judgment sometimes of right. like well maybe you don't have your priorities right you know kind of thing <laughs> right. or oh so you're not praying every day you're right, just yeah, picking it up sometimes <laughs> right and and um so you feel like it's hard. less you feel like it's in other cultures it's well i just never like i mean i'm nigerian so you know they the two questions every auntie is going to ask you is when are you getting married and when you get married when are you going to have your baby and when the babies come when the other other babies come and like that. <laughs> how fast are you going to get the other ones <laughs> so so it is there but like it's also just not uncommon like in the UK or, or in Nigeria it's not uncommon to to be a working mom or to um um or or any of that or to be to able have to, dual to, responsibility yeah or mm -hmm. to be even a little maybe older i think people get married younger here in, in general um so that that was that that was that going on kind of in the background yeah. you just didn't meet the expectations of yeah, what people yeah. thought yeah that's right yeah. so um thank gosh that we don't have to worry about people's <laughs> expectations right <laughs> that we go by god's expectations thank the lord for remembering that thank you this week remember that that it's not the <laughs> expectations of people it's the expectations of god amen. that's what matters amen so um so yeah i had that moment and got got reminded of um that yeah Grace, grace had been there and grace had been sufficient and grace was still there to be received. So anyway, turns out you can eat grace. I suppose so. He I gave a big, so. a big spoonful of grace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so 2016, so probably IVF cycle number two come to, I'm going to get all the years jumbled up, but, um, my, my third round of IVF, I did get pregnant. And I was so certain, God, you know, you made me wait all this time. This Sh is it. This is it. Like, surely, you know, like, whatever test or exam you were trying to have me sit. You I know, passed. I passed. <laughs> you know, um, surely you wouldn't let me get pregnant just to, just to lose it. And I, I don't know. I'd never... I, I don't that just had not entered into my imagination as like an option. It's right. not that I didn't know that it happened. I don't but think I just, that anybody who gets pregnant that yeah, I mean, comes but into their I, brain. I only say that because like in hindsight, being on the other side of it, miscarriage is actually such a common experience. Mm -hmm. But I don't know about you, but growing up as a young woman, I don't remember anybody talking to me about that. No, so I never in any conversation about being a young woman or a girl or a teenager did and, and talking about marriage and pregnancy and life not in school not mm -mm. in family did anybody ever say hey but there's something you need to know mm. I got my first dose of a reality of that 
from a cousin mm -hmm. who went through a miscarriage mm -hmm. and it was so foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you, wait, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that happens? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it actually happens a lot more. It happens a lot. I forget the statistic is like one in five pregnancies or something like that. Yeah. Um, it might even be higher. But um, And then, of course, you know, when it happens, we don't talk about it very often, right? Like somewhere between the the hell the the hurt and the the pain and sometimes even some some shame of like your body didn't do what it was supposed to do but anyways um so yeah for all of those you know complicated reasons i, I just i i didn't it was not part of my imagination or expectation that that could even be a possibility i lost that pregnancy in week seven and um which is a hard week because you're close enough to have heard some things mm -hmm. the heartbeat and know that it mm -hmm. that there was a living yes th it was there yes. right yes and then you're getting just you're almost to the the magic number that's right of, of, 12, weeks. of 12 weeks so that that's a really hard spot mm -hmm. to be in and to have loss um i can relate with you because i've had more miscarriages than i can count on my hands like oh, i right. actually stopped counting them mm. And for where, for like you were talking about, it's not, I didn't think about it. I had had a child with no issues. It, it was nowhere in my mind, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Um, but when it was, when it, when it came time for a possibility to have another child, mm -hmm. I had a miscarriage early on. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you don't talk about it. Mm -mm. And because I'd had a cousin go through it, still didn't really talk to her about it because I, I was wrapped up in trying to understand it because mm. it's not really something you can really understand. And then I got pregnant again pretty quickly after that, which is also common from what I've been told by, the, by doctors, and um, made it past 12 weeks just barely. You know, maybe I was going in for the 12. I'm kind of like you, it's all a big, these are the first two, and after that it's a big blur, but... Um, I went in for like the 12 week, we'd already had some other, because I'd had a miscarriage, we'd already seen the baby a couple times, just because I was, I became mm -hmm. a little bit of a high risk person and went in and I knew there was a problem because the ultrasound, they started acting really funny. Everybody, the ladies whole demeanor changed. Mm -hmm. They ushered us in the back way to the room instead of sending us out through the front. They, mm -hmm. we went down this hallway and got pushed in a room. Um, and then the doctor comes in just not like, hey, how's everybody mm -hmm. going today? He came in and was just real straight to the point. There's no heartbeat. Mm. I'm sorry. Like, you've lost the baby. But in, it's not something we can just do here. You're, you're going to have to set an appointment and have a DNC. Mm. And I'm like, oh, wait, what? I got to do what? Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine um, at that point I did, I reached out to that family member because I, I just couldn't. Yeah. Like, how do you do, how do, you do that? How do you how do you walk into a hospital knowing that there's something there? Write them a check. Oh yeah. <laughs> Write them a check and then be put to sleep and wake up mm -hmm. and now there's nothing there. Right. And everybody just sends you home. Like yeah. the doctor doesn't talk about it with you. Yeah. You know, they they make you comfortable, they're kind, they're sweet. They do a countdown until you fall asleep. But you wake up, you go home with the reality that there's nothing there anymore. That's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult. And I didn't have empathy for that mm -hmm. until I was going through it. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. It is really hard. Um, and it opens up a lot of questions. So many questions. Um, and like I said, you know, for me, I, I don't know. I guess I just was like, you know, God, I've held on and I've waited well. I, I felt like I'd waited well up to that point. Um, so anyway, lost that pregnancy. This was, like I said, this was IVF round number three. So by the way, IVF, for those who may not be familiar with IVF, you're sticking your, uh, you're sticking a needle in your, in your tummy and your butt and, you know, like multiple times. Um, a lot and of hormone changes, lots right? Of, yeah, lots of just up, ups and downs. And again, you know, similar to going to the clinic every, almost every week back in Dubai, it was again, it was, this is, so by round number three, so this is probably like, at least this must be like the second year or so into this whole process of like, oh, and by the way, it's expensive. 
<laughs> Don't forget that Don't part. Forget part. Um, so that was number three. And then we did number four. And, um, and again, you know, I think, you know, you get your three-year disappointment and you, you work yourself up into the, the faith to believe, okay, surely this time. Yeah, you this know, is it. Like, this is it, Lord. Like, you know, okay, we did a test run. You know, maybe you were just testing me. Like, whatever. Um, this time. Um, so um, I got pregnant for a second time. And um, it's a very interesting pregnancy. Um, I, like, about every other week of that pregnancy, I'd bleed. Like, just from out of nowhere, just start bleeding. But every time I'd go to the doctors and they check and everything's fine. Baby's still good. Just got to keep, you know, injecting that progesterone or, you know, whatever. I remember I was about week, uh, when was I in Abu Dhabi? This is early November. So this would have been like week, week 14 or, or so. Week, yeah, week 14, 16. So anyway, we're past the magic number of 12. I had the most enormous bleed. Leia was scared out of his mind because, and I was scared because I'd never seen so much blood in my mm -hmm. life. And I, and I was thinking, oh, okay, for sure, this is it. We're 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 gone. <laughs> um, but you know, went to the doctors. They checked everything. Everything's fine. So fast forward another two three weeks, um, and. Uh, I started having contractions, didn't know what it was. Um, and then I went to the bathroom and I guess I must have broken water. I didn't know what, what that felt like. So right. I was like, okay, this is, this is interesting. But I was in so much pain. So I drove myself to the, to the hospital. Long story short, um, I lost my baby. Um, and this was so much more painful and um, horrific because, A, I'd gotten past 12 weeks. Yeah, you made it through the magic number. Right, made it through the magic number. Yeah. Already been through the worst of, like, all these bleeding. So, like, this this baby is rugged and, yeah. like, <laughs> she she's toughing it out. And, um, but not just that, like it was also tough because I had to deliver her mm. and um, delivered her this very real, tiny, but very real baby girl. And uh, man, like I remember sitting on the hospital bed and you know, when you deliver the baby, there's all, my body's shaking. Like there's just so much going on with the body that I even till now still don't understand. And, uh, oh. And man. there's so much mentally, not yeah. just physically. Yeah. There's a lot of mental. It's hard to wrap your head around something that doesn't go the way it goes for what seems to be like everybody else. Oh, God. I, uh, I was in, you know, it was like disbelief. Like, um, but even in that moment, I remember sitting with a couple of friends that came to be with me and um, like I knew, I knew that my heart needed to worship, but I could not get a sound out of my mouth. It's like, I want to God, because I know that that's the right response. I know, and I want to, it's not even like, oh, I'm doing it because I feel like I should, like I, my heart wants to. But I can't get it out. I my, I can't get it out of my mouth. And so I I asked them to to sing. I told them what to sing and they sang. And so um Christina Ellis and Rachel Patterson. <laughs> those were these those were those were my friends that were with me and um and they sang and I just let my without moving my lips, just let my my heart kind of join them in, in singing. Um, we named her Oluwaloni, which means she belongs to God, um, because I, I didn't get to have her, you know? So I was like, okay, Lord, this one's, this is your one. You get this one. Um, 
anyway, so then we, uh, Leia, like, gets, he was in Abu Dhabi. He got on the next flight, you know, like, was back home in less than 24 hours and came home. And then the body just starts to do crazy things because it thinks that you've delivered a baby. So mm-hmm. like my my boobs are like leaking milk and all the things. Like it's it's just it's so hard. You don't so get to hard. you don't get to leave the hospital <sighs> and go home and just leave yeah. it all there. Like you have to re- you have to relive it. Yeah. Through all the the motions of what you're talking about, what it looks like to be after pregnancy. Yeah. And it, it feels it's a little it's, unfair. It's unfair. Like, and it feels like a trick too. It's like, okay, so body, you know how to do this, but you couldn't have done your, done right. your job back there. <laughs> yeah. Who you dropped know? the ball right. in this department? So um, anyways, I, I, I took a month off work. I didn't even ask for permission. I was just like, I'm, I'm off and I don't know when I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I, I said to my husband, like, I'm not going to do this again. Like, and we were caught in this in between of not, it wasn't that I lost faith that God can or that he would or that he could, but I just didn't have the energy to put towards that hope anymore. And you were tired. Yes. Like in every way. I was exhausted. Like, I can't do this again. And I don't want to do it again. And, um, you know, when we talked about that and prayed about that and and just, you know, it's like, maybe, what if this is all God has for us? And can we be content in that? Can we be content with that maybe this is what life looks like for us, right? And so it's just this juxtaposition of, like, faith in God that I know you can, and I know I'm not throwing this back in your face. Like, I'm not giving up on you, God. I'm just saying that I'm not doing this anymore. Like, you do what you want to do when you want to do it. But, like, I just cannot, I do not have the energy for, for, to kind of just, like, go through this again. So that's on one side. It's like, I have faith. I do have faith. That did not ever waver for me. I have I believe in you God. At the same time, I I'm I'm I need to learn to be content with where I am and be be content and okay with the possibility that I don't become a mother, at least not in this way. That your plan and his plan could actually not be on the same track. Right. And the verse that I held on to, which I love, and I, I forget exactly what translation this is. I believe it's the NIV. Romans 4, 32. Um, it talks about Abraham. And he was waiting. He and Sarah were waiting a long time, right? For God had given him a promise at this point. God had made a promise to him. But they were, what, 10... 10 or so years into waiting and nothing had happened. And the verse says, Abraham believed God. I forget if it's a but or it's an and, but Abraham believed God, but he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Abraham believed God on this side, but he faced the fact on this side, yeah. <laughs> right? And, and I think that's kind of where I was of like, I believe God, but I'm dealing with my reality of like, maybe this is, this is not it. This is not going to work. And, um, like I always felt through the, through miscarriages. Cause I had several more after that, uh, before we had another child. Um, like maybe my body's just broken. Mm. Like, well, I w- do, you, do you know what they called my condition? Apparently I had what's, um, an incompetent cervix. Hmm. Isn't that a confidence booster? <laughs> Hi, my name is Foye. And I have an incompetent <laughs> cervix. There's your new title. There you go. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't know who comes up. If any people in the medical profession, if you're listening, you should not come up with a different name for that thing. <laughs> like, it is. It doesn't feel good right. to be told you right. have an incompetent cervix. Well, at least your you got, cervix is stupid. At least you got 
at least you got a definition. I had a doctor in Alabama that looked at me and just said, I don't know. It just, it's just not working. So I don't, it's over. You're not having any more kids. Mm. I was okay. Y'all that's two kids in now we have five, Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) but two kids. I didn't even, I didn't even get a title. Mm. I just got a, there's some genetic testing, but I mean, yeah, Mm. that's, I, I think this is it. Yeah. That's not very comforting either. No, nope. no. <laughs> Neither of these tactics are very no. <laughs> well laid out for people. No. But you know what I learned through that? And maybe not, it's, I mean, it's not so much that I learned it through that. It, I guess it's, again, like the identity thing. It's something that you know, but then sometimes life happens that makes you, okay, put it to, put it to application now, this right. thing that you've been talking about. And... Um, I think what I, what was crystallizing for me through all of that season is the following truths. God, God is good. God loves me. And the greatest good that God wants and has for me is is to become like Jesus. Mm, that's so good. It's not the things, it's not the baby, it's not the house, it's not the job, it's not the husband, it's not the all the things. And yes, those things will come. Oftentimes they do. But that's not the goal. Yeah, even it's, if they don't. Right. So Romans 8:28 says we all know this, we love this. 8:20 Romans 8:20 God um All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We usually end there. But 29 says, for or because those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the likeness of his son, Jesus. The good that's working out is that we become more like Jesus. That's the good. That's the gold at the end of the rainbow deal. Like, and sometimes your ride through the rainbow is going to get you all the beauty and all the glory and all the radiance of all those beautiful colors, right? And sometimes it's going to be through a storm and sometimes it's going to be through some really heavy gray clouds that he brings you through to that pot of gold. And that pot of gold is that we become more like Jesus somehow. That's what he's working out in us. And that was like what was crystallized for me, that somehow in walking through this, that I've experienced just a deep, so hard to articulate love of God and for God. So hard to articulate like an experience of his grace that really truly was sufficient because I have known marriages that would have broken down and mental health that would have broken down and jobs that would have broken down and been lost under the the pressure of all of that over nine years or so. Um, but yeah, I think that that was the thing that was crystallized for me and, and a lesson that I that I've held on to. Like, you know, I said, you know, you don't remember it perfectly every single time. And, and I pray that God doesn't see fit to have to like remind me in some kind of hard way anytime soon. But, but, uh, <laughs> this is not this is not asking for a, a refresher this not, course. This is not an invitation to test, but um, um, not that you need one. But, you're saying. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think that's what crystallized for me. If God, God is good. He loves me. And, and because those two things are true, he's worthy of my worship any any day in anything and through anything. But three, like, yeah, we will go through these hard times. And, and for somebody who's listening, like, I'm not the one to say, oh, um, what are those platitudes that we often say? Oh, oh, it's for a reason. God does everything for a reason. Mm-mm. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I don't say that to anybody no right. more. Like, and it's 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 not because God is sovereign, sovereign, but he uh, and he does have reason, but not in this like oh, one door shuts, then another door opens type of kind of way. The good, the good, and the glory in this is that we get to be like Jesus. That that's that's the thing, and it's but that hard. doesn't hit everybody. The right, I'm not. I'm agreeing with you. It's not. 
I've also shot away from well, everything happens in a for in, in a reason in a season, or God God takes everything. Oh, and they, works it's it better it. if it rhymes. Yeah, Miranda. <laughs> I forgot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, people like it if it rhymes. Yes. Either way, um, there's something I, I think that we're, we're flawed as Christians, and I'm guilty of this. So I'm trying to say this the best way I can get it without it sounding ugly. I don't want to be condemning because I'm in this group. It sounds better for you to tell me something fluffy mm. than to tell me that my pain and my suffering is actually drawing me nearer to God, and that should be the pot of gold. Mm. And that's twisted. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm trying to get to is yeah. that it's twisted. There's, I should find comfort in those words. I should see it as an invitation but it's not always my first go-to if I'm just being honest. Oh, and, and, and neither neither is it neither <laughs> is it mine. You know, Ty Drivett said something on a on a reel, and I'm not gonna remember it. Came up on my Facebook or whatever. How is that? Like, you know, the, the promise of His presence to us in Isaiah 43, where it says, "You will walk through the waters, but I will be with you." You, you will not walk drown. through. You will not drown. You will. You'll. You'll go through the fires, but you will not be burned. I will be with you, and and yes, I mean, what a blessing, glory, and hallelujah that He can have us have have us go through fire and water, and we will not be drowned, and we will not burn. But that's not the that's not the gold in that story. The gold in that story is I will be with you, right? And. Man, I, I just like I screamed, your grace. What what can I do with your grace? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to do with this? Can't eat this. You know, and but I think sometimes that's that's our short sightedness and our lack of understanding yes. of how glorious and beautiful yep. it is to have Jesus, and and how glorious and beautiful it is to to somehow in some small little itty bitty way because it won't be completed until we see him that we become more like him more that we 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 just grasp a little bit more more of him that's that's the gift is his presence it's it's not the the pre, the present yeah right it's it's that he's he's with us and i think if we can let god minister to us just the import and the weight and the beauty and the glory of that like i think man there's that's where the joy is that's where the hope is. That's where grace is. Um, and those so, yeah. are in heavily, I think of those as being like heavenly things mm-hmm. versus earthly things. Like mm-hmm. I'm thinking of that in the sense of a lot of us find the joy and the happiness. We place a lot of things on the things on that list. Mm-hmm. If I just had this, mm-hmm. then I'd be that. Mm-hmm. If I just had this, then I could see God more faithfully. Mm-hmm. Those are earthly, those are our earthly check boxes. Mm-hmm. But when you're in God, in a heavenly realm, that the that that what I can't see, what I can't touch, what I can't feel, but you're with me. Mm-hmm. Your your peace passes all of my understanding. Yeah, abundantly more. Not so much meaning He's going to give you all the things you want, but abundantly more with Him. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's something that's so beautiful and so filling in that, yes. and I just feel like a lot of us miss that. We miss it. And the thing is, like, I think when you're able to grasp a hold of that, that is something God gives us that we we won't lose. You know, that you could lose the house, yep. you could lose the job. I mean, God forbid, but you could even lose the children. Yep. And spoiler alert, I do have children. And now. we're gonna get to it. We promise. <laughs> <I do laughs> we're have working our way now. there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's go there. So you did have a season. You had a season where um, you had to work through. What if this is it? Uh-huh. Like, what if the gifts are found just in the presence of God? And mm-hmm. my husband and I live a life that's just outpouring back to him. Mm-hmm. Like, what if, mm-hmm. right? I'm mm-hmm. sure that felt like a very long season. Mm-hmm. Um, but then something happened Yay. while you were in that season. Well, I was in that Let's season. talk about it. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I remember, well, I mean, first off, God gave me a new job, which is amazing because... You know, speak, that was another thing on my list of the things that I was like frustrated about. Um, God gave me a new job. I was three weeks into this my new job, and I was tired a lot. And um, you know, 
I thought, you know, when you start a new job, you're drinking from a fire hose and, <laughs> and all this kind of thing. It's I love that. It's, yeah. Drinking like from a fire hose. It's normal to kind of feel overwhelmed or whatever. And I, I don't know why it was that my husband suggested for me to do a pregnancy test. Because it just was like, I mean, we were just not in that headspace, but he did. I was like, okay, sure, whatever. Like, well, we can at least rule it out. Yeah. Um, but then the the pink stick or whatever it was, pink line, whatever, the two lines show up. The double line. And we were like, what in the world? Like, this is odd. Like, uh, <laughs> it's a little strange. This is strange. And like, not to get into like TMI or whatever, but like just the, from a biological perspective and like spacing back to like when I'd had my last period and all this kind of thing, like it just some of the math ain't math and I don't understand. I like to call that funny math. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what's going on here. Um, and, you know, we didn't get excited about it because it was like, you know, here we go again, here we go again. Mm -hmm. And, and who knows what could happen, but, you know, we went to the doctor and they confirmed, they sewed up my incompetent cervix. <laughs> so, <laughs> Did a little work on that. <laughs> so I had to, had to, had to work on that. Um, but anyway, lo and behold, uh, you know, my son was born, um, on March, in March 28th, March 28th, 2019. And, um, uh, we were like that whole pregnancy was just like, just this ginger, ginger, ginger walk because it was like, you know, you almost don't want to like trust it yet. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember I didn't even tell even my family that we were pregnant until we were well past like 20 weeks. Yeah, right. our last two kids, we we told people when we found out what we were having. Mm. And it was easy to do because we were in Texas mm -hmm. and all our family was in Alabama. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to do. I didn't want to deal with it. Yeah, didn't just and you know having lost my my daughter at, at eighteen weeks is like, you know we we just needed to get past that. I didn't set up a registry. I didn't you know all those things. And again, going back to that juxtaposition of like I do have faith. Yeah. But this is the this is the reality, mm -hmm. yeah. And kind of holding those two things at the same time, um, and actually, I just want to encourage somebody that like holding those two things, being saying like this is my reality, that doesn't make you not a good Christian or or faithless or you know, it's that's just life, like you know we live in this in between this juxtaposition of like God is real heaven is here, but also heaven is ahead of us. Right. Like, um, so no judgment there. Um, but yeah, so we didn't start getting exciting, excited about it until, um, I think past 20 and then like week 24, like six months, like, okay, you know, <laughs> we better start doing something, you know? <laughs> um, and, and here's the, here's the sweet thing too. Like the last couple of pregnancies that I had were, you know, I told you how it was every other week, sometimes every other day, it was like bleeding, bleeding. This pregnancy was so simple. It was so easy. So like uneventful. You know, and it sounds a little boring. I mean, like, <laughs> I'm no, kidding, I'm kidding. no drama. Yeah, you just, for real. you've got to just go experience it yes. and go through it. And you probably uh, had enough drama in your head. You didn't need it to be in the uh, body, too. And and maybe, maybe heaven said she passed the test. Maybe I got an A <laughs> the last time or something and I didn't need to go through all of that again. I don't know, but, um, or it, it might have just been mercy. I mean, and I, I'm, I'm thankful for that. I just feel like it's another way in which like God just crowned that entire season yeah. um, by just having this, the beautiful gift of my son, but also the beautiful gift of just a sweet, beautiful, easy pregnancy. Um, so yeah, so Andrew Law was born on March 28th, his name means we're feasting on the goodness of God. And that's, oh, that. that's kind of just how we 
how we felt. And I also said shortly after he was born, I said to my husband, and we're not doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick, like it was like, we got it, we're done. Right. That's because, it. Like, I mean, Cook here's going back to faith and reality. The reality for me was this was what nine plus years of needles and meds and loss and this like roller coaster emotional roller coaster of is it coming is it coming oh let me th- another thing not just the incompetent cervix they used to have these i don't know if it was the ovulation test or the pregnancy test where it's a smiley face or a sad face <laughs> oh that is a bad design <laughs> that is a bad product right. design to have the things frown at me right that's not nice right it's bad enough you're already frowning yourself uh-huh. you don't need another frown I don't know if that's still in the market, but somebody working in marketing. What would be better? A, a no? I don't or even know. Is there know, something that's but not the line. a frowny face? Maybe they should just go back to the lines. <laughs> yes, the lines are just fine. That seems a little bit more objective. Like, don't frown at me. Before we found out our surprise pregnancy, we were um, we were actually um, um, on the track to adoption. We we were researching and filling in application forms, and then we kind of put a pause on that when we found out we were pregnant. Um, so we picked that back up again and um, fast forward two years afterward, um, uh, waiting for for a match, right, with a birth mom. And we we got a call from a birth mom. And we, we were so sure it would happen quickly and fast because um, uh, there's such a need yeah. for... Um, Huge need for parents, especially black parents. And uh, we were so sure it happened quickly, but it wasn't happening happening quickly for it seems us. Like that's, <laughs> it seems like there might be a little bit of a theme in your story. I, I mean, just saying, uh, I don't know. I could be wrong. <laughs> so it wasn't happening quickly for us. And then we got the first call, the birth mom. We spoke to the birth mom, and we thought, okay, great. This is awesome. And... Um, and her story was interesting, and we thought, oh, well, this is this is great. Like, we'll, we're ready. Then she ghosted us, and so that was like another thing. And and again, I just I guess going back to my first miscarriage, like I, I don't know why, but I wasn't expecting that to be a part of the story. Right. You know, like you match with a birth mom, and it goes great, and you. You get your child and... Yeah, they've like, made their decision. You made your decision. Right. Yeah, yeah, I did. Anyway, but she ghosted us. And so it was like kind of having a miscarriage again. So that was a kind of a weird right. experience. Um, and then three months later, we got another call about another birth mom match. And so it was kind of like reliving the story again of like, how how much stock should I put in, in into this is um, this what God's is this what God's wanting? If yeah, yeah so you're you re-questioning know. everything you've already re-questioned. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and it going back to timelines, you know, at this point I'm about to be forty, and I'm like, God, you know, my my husband's seven years old, and I am like, if we don't have enough, like, I can't be changing diapers at like fifty five. I know that's the story for some people, but like, right, you know, I, I can't do that. So I was like. If this isn't it, if this isn't it, Lord, like again, we'll just close the chapter here. Romans eight, Romans four thirty two, right? Going back there, like I have faith, but this is my reality, right? Um, and just trying to be content with what we have and where we're where we're at. Anyway, so um, uh, the birth mom, she was four weeks out to her due date. She. The, we kept having this back and forth, and she wasn't sure, she wasn't sure, but we kept talking. Then um, we were supposed to have a phone call. We'd made the appointment. She didn't show up to the, she didn't pick up, she didn't show up to the appointment. Um, and I remember saying to my husband, this is it again. Like, you know, we've been ghosted again. I then wake up to a text where the agency is like, you've got to get to Nevada like now because from she, Texas. Yes, because <laughs> she she went into labor. So evidently that's why she didn't make the call. Um and I'm like, okay, I understand you're telling me the baby's been born, but has, has she actually told y'all that yeah. she like has she said that? And the agency was like, Well, she said that you should come 
I said, no, no. I said, but did she say, like, is she is she ready? Had she made her decision? And in, anyway, long story, no, she hadn't made a decision, but she had asked for us to come. Okay, fine, we'll come. And this is where we're... Now, walking in, walking in faith and hope and expectation in, in the story of adoption is a very complicated thing because I could not bring myself to pray for this mother to give up her child. That just didn't seem like right. the right prayer, right? It's, it's like your will. I was like, this is more of like a God's will be done yeah, it's situation. Yeah, like your will be done because either of us is in a position to love this child well. Right. And 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 like this is this wasn't a situation where she was like a druggie or or anything like the child would have been perfectly safe. Could she have provided for her like we 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 could probably not cuz she was super young. That was that was part of the story. Anyway, get there. Um and uh over there it's 72 hours before she can terminate her rights. Her parental rights. And day one happens. She says she's sure. Um, she's about to leave the hospital. She comes back to meet me with tears in her eyes to say, like, I, like she's not sure. Um, and all this stuff. And my heart just dropped. <sighs> I mean, what a, an emotional roller coaster for both of you. <sighs> I don't even know how you drove there knowing you're going to a baby that possibly could come home with you, but maybe not because we're not really sure. Like, I don't know how you opened your heart to even be able to step in the room with her and, and be like, this may or may not work. And, you know, um, what was also hard about it was she wasn't opening up to anybody. You know, the agency offers these, like, services for her to, to talk to and counsel right. and blah, blah, blah. She wasn't talking to them. She chose only to talk to me for whatever reason. And so like, I'm having to kind of manage my emotions at the same time as try to love her well and try to be neutral and objective, you know, with her and for her. Oof, that's a whole Jesus thing right there. Um, so that was day one. Day two- Like I loving sh- her without wanting something from yes. her. Yes, yeah. and. Um, so day two, I went up and was with the baby all day. She didn't. She didn't come to the hospital at all. I was there from like 8 a.m. It gets to like 9 p.m. and I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe I'll go. I hadn't eaten all day. I'd been with the with, with the baby all day. She shows up at nine, um, and uh, she starts to ask the nurses questions about like advice to looking after the child. She starts to talk to me about that and and uh so like I could tell like she's very seriously considering doing this on her own and she told me her story and you know I gave her some counsel just about like what wisdom is and I told her I said look you know you need to know that whatever choice you make here is a loving choice if you choose to take her home that's love and if you choose to let her come home with us, that's also love, right? And so she was a believer, so that was that was sweet to be able to get to pray with her. But anyway, so then the third day, Leia now comes in. He 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 gets in, and um, I think that morning was Monday morning. She had said she sent me a text. She was you know, um, it's just too soon. I can't make a decision. I said okay. But I just want you to know that, you know, once we leave, we're not coming back. Um, but, you know, we have a gift for you. We'd love to come in and see you and say goodbye. Because she hadn't met my husband yet. So we went to go see her. And um, we were about 10 or 15 minutes into the conversation. And she just all of a sudden said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> what? And Lay and I were like, what what just what just happened here? She says, Okay, just so we called the agency, she said, Are you guys still open? First off, we we're like, Are you sure? She was yeah. she was in the military, so she came into the room into her apartment with um her um her sergeant. So I turned to the sergeant, like, um, is everything okay here? Yeah, <laughs> like, what is this? What is going yeah, on? What is this? You know? <laughs> 
And Ooh, that's um, a lot. Yeah, but it was just it just seemed like this all of a sudden like snap decision. Anyway, long story short, um, you know, we by seven o'clock that night, um, Eliana's ours she's our daughter and we're going home with her and you're and, bringing her home and uh we had w- when my husband and i were on our way to the apartment we were just like okay let's just get this over with figure out where we're gonna eat i'd like some alcohol please for <laughs> whenever we're done i mean i know we're christians here but i'm just keeping it real like you know um i just i just wanted to, i just want to have some food have some drink be with my husband and and then go home Back right. to my life and my family. Shut this chapter. Yes. Um, and then God flipped the script on us. <laughs> He's good at that. He is good. But again, like you can see, even as I'm telling it now, like all the parallels in both stories of just like waiting and the juxtaposition of like God can do it, God will do it, but this is my reality. And in, and this time around, having to kind of walk alongside somebody else, like bring somebody else or step into somebody else's story in that too. Um, and you know, I think, I think God had, that was, I guess that was part of God's design for that journey. And I think that meant something to her that probably I will never fully right. know or understand. And it certainly <laughs> meant something for, for using us. and growing you all at the same time. There you go. So, so anyways, so fast forward, I, we have two beautiful children. Like I said, Andrea is, is, um, is five. Eliana is two. Her name means God heard, God answered. Um, cause that's just how we felt of just like, wow, you know, through this like crazy, crazy weekend of a story, he completed our family. And so both of my children are miracle children in very different ways. They certainly have a story. <laughs> <laughs> they certainly already have a story. Yeah. I was thinking about, we sing it here at church. Um, um, I sought the Lord. Mm-hmm. I sought the Lord mm-hmm. and he heard, he heard and, he and he answered. answered. And that's why I trust him. Yeah. It's not because he always gives me what mm-hmm. I want. Mm-hmm. It's not because the list gets checked every bit or any mm-hmm. bit of it. It's because I know that I sought him and he heard me yeah. and he was with me. Yes. And that's why I trust him. Yes. And, and you know, there's a, whenever we sing that song, I, there's a little ad lib in my, in my head that I sing, <laughs> sing to myself, which is, you know, in, in that song says, this poor man cried and you heard him. And I feel like David there or whoever it was that wrote that song of like, going back to grace of like, I don't know why you would mind me because you don't have to, but you do and you did. This poor man, of all people, of all, and I don't, I don't, I, I don't know why that, that just, um, he heard my cry. He, it's not that I'm, I'm, worth it any any more than anybody else but he 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 tended to me and man i i'm so 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 thankful the stones of my life as i gather them up you know people people say why i worship the way that i do or you know it's because i've lived this thing he is good and um when I when I arrange all those stones, that's the altar of my worship right there because I I've seen it year after year, season after season, storm after storm that we've come through. <sighs> anyway, I mean I don't feel like there's anything left to say, Toye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I think you just summed it up beautifully. None of us do. None of us deserve, like you said, for him to hear and for him to be. But he does. He's faithful. Yeah. He's so faithful. He's faithful in the storm. He's faithful at the top. Mm-hmm. He's faithful in, as one of our um, interviews, interviewers said, in the ditch. Mm-hmm. He's faithful. And that's that's the bottom line. I, I wrote this down. I, I love, as we wrap up, this is what you said. And this is what, if you don't hear anything else this week, if you don't hear this beautiful story, if you don't hear the faithfulness of God, if you don't, if you don't understand the stones of remembrance, hear this. So this is what Toye said. Three things. God is good. 
God loves you. And I'm going to say it just like you said it. I'm looking at my notes. He wants for me to be like Jesus in all seasons, in all days, in all ways. I mean, that sums it up Mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's simple. Yeah. I think we confuse it a lot of times. We we try to put more into it. We try to go digging for things because we want what we want, right? I I mean, I'm human. If I have a need, if I have something I'm praying for, I want it. Yeah. But I have to take a step back often and remember, what does God want in this situation? What is, what is he going to do? How's, how can he, how's he going to use it? And I mean, you've just demonstrated that so beautifully, especially your part through adoption of how you had to self lay down what you wanted. Mm-hmm. You know, you wanted, you know, you wanted to leave there with that baby. You know that more than anything, even helping to convince her to do the right thing. There's a tug that's, mm-hmm. there's something in us that would want to be like, but I really don't, but I really want to leave. But to just do like Jesus and just lay down self mm-hmm. for someone else. I mean, how beautiful. I, we could all learn a lesson in that every day, <laughs> <laughs> every day of the week. Okay, well, as we wrap up, is there, you have any final thoughts, any, any final thing you'd like to say, anything that's come into mind that you feel like you would like to say to our listeners regarding all the amazing things we just talked about? Yeah, maybe just like two things. Um, one is that, again, going back to Romans 8, 28 and 29, God wants our holiness, which is us becoming more like him. He wants our holiness more than he wants our happiness. And I know that that can sound like a awkward thing to say, but like I would just say just chew on that. And, and I hope that God encourages you with that. And then the second piece as a part of that is I, I hope and pray that for all of us that we can come to know and cherish and give all its and recognize for all that it is worth the gift of I will be with you. Whatever it is, right there where you're miscarrying, right there where you've lost your job, right there where you're suffering, you're suffering through some kind of loss or death or any kind of pain, he's with you. And I hope that the gift of that, if we can just embrace and receive that, that's bigger, better, and more than anything. Oh, thank you so much. I think that's beautiful and such good words to chew on this week. Um, It's good words on a Monday to chew on for sure. As if you don't need enough for a Monday. There's just some good words for a Monday. Okay, guys, well, as always, you know, we've talked about a lot of topics here that may be hard for some of you who are walking in these. Um, we always want to offer resources. You can go to our webpage at www.steppingforwardfwd.org. We have a contact us, us section there. If you need prayer, we have a prayer section there. Um, if you're, you know, just maybe something she said resonated with you, with you today and you You have some questions, you have some thoughts, you have some feelings, you'd like to feel in a safe space to share that. You can go to our webpage and certainly do that. You can email us. Uh, We will respond. So whatever, whatever you're feeling the Holy Spirit, or just if you feel something, you're not even sure what it is tugging on you. um, You can certainly go there. Maybe you don't know who Jesus is. Maybe you don't understand how these things happen in life. We would love to tell you more about who he is and how you can enter into a relationship with him. So also feel free on any of our social media pages, on any of our, our webpage, um, anywhere where you can send a message, we will get it. So we would love to walk through that with you as well. So um, as we are concluding this episode, um, I also hope that you remember that despite the storms that we face, walking with God doesn't guarantee smooth sailing as you've seen in this story today. But it does promise his steadfast presence and the opportunity for growth amidst what you're going through. Just as the hard rain nourishes the soul and brings forth new life, I hope that we can press on with God through the storms of life, trusting that he is cultivating within us fresh growth and resilience. So let's embrace the storms as opportunities for deeper faith and greater dependence on the one who calms the winds and the waves. Keep pressing on with God. Keep stepping forward with God for in him, there is always hope beyond the storm. You guys have a great week. We'll see you later, (laughs) y'all.
thank you for joining us on today's episode of Southern Soul Chats. We hope you found inspiration, encouragement, and valuable insights to carry with you through your week. We invite you to subscribe to Southern Soul Chats so that you never miss an episode. We are a branch of Stepping Forward Ministries, a 501c3 Christian nonprofit, and we kindly ask for you to consider making a donation today. Your contribution will play a vital role in sustaining the podcast and allowing us to continue sharing these impactful stories of faith. As you leave today, remember your story is a part of a bigger narrative and your faith has power to guide your path. Keep stepping forward with hope, trust, and assurance that you're never alone. This is Dr. Miranda Ferguson. We hope you have a great week and keep stepping forward.